Well, thank you for joining me. Your presence honors me, and I hope that uh, this becomes a productive study tonight as we study Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Well, we're nearing our end of the studies in the book of Hebrews, and the author, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Uh, an interesting study I think we have tonight. We're going to have to move quickly because we have a lot of things going on here. And there'll be a rather uh, special uh, exclusive for my Patreon viewers as well. And the memory text is from Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, there's a slightly different translation than the title of the lesson, finisher, perfecter. This has to do with the word, the, the idea of perfection is one of, of maturity and completion. And so both of those meetings fit very well into this, uh, into the, to the verse that we're looking at here. And it's interesting, he despised the shame. He, 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 the shame was of nothing as far as he was concerned. And because of that, because he's the author and finisher of our faith, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's a beautiful, beautiful promise, really. And that shows the perfection of our faith because as we've seen in previous lessons, he's made us to sit down in heavenly places with him. That is perfection of our faith, that we get to rule with him. The uh, righteous will live by faith. This is a quotation. Of course, Romans is the famous one, but he's quoting uh, Habakkuk in that case. And here we have an interesting uh, revisitation of that idea in Romans. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may serve what was promised. Yeah, I'm sorry. Or you will have, you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet, in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Meantime, the righteous will live by faith. And interestingly enough, in this particular uh, text, we have kind of a preview or an explanation of what that means to live by faith. What is this, this faith? And the answer is that it, it's confidence. When we, uh, we talk about trusting in God, but that trusting in God means that you are confident in that God will take care of you, that, that he will do what he says, that he who is coming will come, that he who has promised never to forsake you will not forsake you. This is the kind of confidence that allows you to endure the hard times. Now, I say this, it's not that easy. Uh, I certainly don't find it easy to endure difficult times, but it is a way of building faith and testing our faith when this comes, building what I call crash-proof faith. And we see this in the, uh, of course, in the three Hebrew uh, worthies who said, our God is well able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But if not, they have confidence they can withstand that because even if he does not rescue them, they have confidence that he will take care of them in some way, some way they do not yet understand. And that's exactly when we get to the definition of faith. Faith is the evidence of the things not seen, the substance of things which we hope for. And so they hope for deliverance, but they hope for deliverance in a more uh, eternal and lasting way than simply to survive the fiery furnace. They want eternal life. And so they have confidence and they're able to endure that. But if 
not. And so that's important to understand. And that's part of what's happening. And then you have the other part, which is he who is coming will come. That's what gives you that's that what you confidence in. He's made these promises, whatever they are. And they, of course, the ultimate one, ultimate one that remains for us is that he will return. The ultimate one was that he would die for us, but that's been done. It's, it's a matter of history. And so the ultimate uh, promise remaining is that he will come. He will put an end to this world and he will bring about a perfect world, the world for which we were originally created, the world in which death is an alien and does not exist, the death in which uh, the, the, the world in which sorrow and suffering have no part. We feel it in this world that they should not be here, and we will, that, that part of the promise is that he will restore us to a world where they will not be here. The righteous will live by faith. Our faith, which manifests itself in confidence and endurance, is based on God's faithfulness. He who is coming will come. And this is the first of the key points in this lesson, that our faith is based on God's faithfulness. We can have confidence. We can endure because we know he is faithful. And I say this over and over again, but it's, it bears repeating that ever after the flood, and you have this rainbow that is his, his covenant that he'll never destroy the earth again with water. You, every time the, picture, the, the, the throne of God is pictured in scripture, there's a rainbow, meaning he is faithfully remembering his covenant. We may lose sight of it. We may forget about it. We may not be thinking about the flood. We may not be thinking about his faithfulness. But the minute we see him and his throne, there is this rainbow saying, I never forget my covenants, and I will always honor them. That is what gives us, part of what gives us our, our faith, and it makes us allow, allows us to have endurance and in confidence. He never forgets. He never uh, fails. And that's important. That's, that's what we base our faith on. We can trust him because of that faithfulness. So that's true. Then we have three days of the lesson. And there are three sections of, uh, th well, there are, th three, there are three heroes of faith which are mentioned. There's a whole long list of people, of course, in chapter 11, the faith chapter. But there are three heroes of faith that are mentioned specifically in this lesson. And I want to look at them, and uh, there was, there's some extra things thrown in here. The three heroes of faith which he mentions by name. Uh, the, uh, the author of our lesson uh, picks out by name are Abraham, Moses, and Rahab. All right, so there are three heroes of faith. Now, Abraham, the, he doesn't use this text, but here's the, here's the point. Abraham says to Isaac, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God will provide for himself the lamb. Abraham understands this. And we get all uh, tangled up and it makes perfect sense because he has only one son and God has asked him to sacrifice it. And you know, the lesson goes into the fact that Abraham says, hey, he gave, he gave us a son when, when we were past childbearing. Both my wife and I were too old. And yet he gave us a son. And even if I have to give him up in sacrifice, then God has the power to resurrect him, to bring him back to life. If he can bring a child out of those who are almost dead uh, and, and uh, beyond childbearing, then he can certainly bring us a child out of, you know, whatever. Um, and so when Isaac says, where is the lamb? Abraham says with perfect honesty, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And that he's, Abraham is counting that God, you know, God has, has honored his promise already to Abraham by giving him Isaac. And he knows that based on God's faithfulness, again, 
that he can trust God to protect, to uh, resurrect if necessary, to guide, to work through Isaac as well. And so that's how the basis of his faith. Abraham understands that God is the one who is providing. If, 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 uh, if uh, Isaac were to be the sacrifice, God would have provided that lamb too. But of course, uh, no human beings, the death of any human being, could not possibly uh, rescue us from sin. It had to be God as the human being, that 100% that God, 100% human being, who, uh, who could take away the sin of the world. So Abraham speaks in faith, and it's a greater faith than he even understands. But it's a great faith that he has to even say what he does. And now I'm going to come to something because it mentions Abraham, it mentions Moses, it mentions Rahab. And then there's in this story of uh, the, the faithful in, in, in uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews, there is a mention of Sarah. And I'm going to, this is going to be, I'm sorry, but um, this is slightly off topic. And this is the kind of thing I do in depth for my Patreon patrons. And that is, uh, what about Sarah? And that's going to be the topic for, for the Patreon exclusive. Now, it talks about in, in the, in the uh, most of the translations, it says something like this we have in the uh, NIV. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear the children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And Sarah comes in here almost out of nowhere because uh, Rahab is there, but there, there are very few women in this, this list. But it's interesting because the NIV has a footnote and a, an alternative reading, and the alternative reading over, is over here. By faith, Abraham, even though he was too old to have children, and Sarah herself was not able to conceive, was enabled to become a father. This is the translation, of the, it's an alternate translation of the same verse. Now, the issues of the Greek meaning of whether it was Abraham or Sarah are far too technical for the average person. They're far, frankly, they're far too technical for me to understand well enough to explain them. I've looked at them. I, 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 think, I think I know what's going on. But it's one thing to, to uh, think you uh, understand something and another to be able to teach it. And... Uh, the point is, these two are both, there, there are a number of translations that say it's Abraham and a number that say it's Sarah. And here we have a really interesting example of uh, Bible study because the text itself is ambiguous. That is to say, this verse in Hebrews 11 is ambiguous. You cannot tell the meaning, uh, whether it should be Sarah or Abraham, for certain simply by examining the text in this verse. But remember, the verses are human invention, too, that this was originally written as a longer passage. And the longer passage is where we're going to look and find the answer, because in chapter 11, in verses 8 through 19, this whole thing takes place. And we need to look at it because we need to see what's happening here. This, this, this is a way one of the rules of good exegesis is when you, can, when you cannot determine the meaning of a text within a very short space, like the verse itself, and then the sentence itself, then you broaden your perspective. And the first thing you do is you take the larger passage that it occurs in. Of course, Hebrews 11 has all of these heroes of faith, but the story of Sarah, this mention of Sarah, takes place in the middle of the story of Abraham. And I'm going to show you why that works, and what light it may shed. Now, when I get done with this, there's, I'm not going to claim that I have the absolute answer here. I'm simply going to lay out the evidence, and I'll tell you what I think makes most sense. But you'll have to decide for yourself based on the evidence, because there is no absolute scriptural authority for this. It's not that kind of thing. Uh, it's a human, the, the, the Bible is produced by human beings speaking human languages. God inspired it, but human languages, by their nature, are ambiguous. They have more than one meaning, and we can only tell, many times, we can only tell the meaning by the context, and even in our own language that we think we know so well. 
And I could go on about that, but this is not the place. So I've got two columns here. The one, if, if Abraham is the subject, and the second one is if Sarah is the subject, because you want to look at these. Here's what, here's what the verses say, starting with verse 8. And this is both translations side by side. So we want to look at this in this way. First of all, by faith, Abraham obeyed. The, the whole passage begins, this passage about Abraham's faith, begins in verse 8. And both translations agree. That is both, if it's Sarah or if it's Abraham, they both say, by faith, Abraham obeyed. And of course, we know what that what's that talking about. He left the land of his fathers and so forth. And he went to a land he did not know and so forth. That's number eight. That's verse number eight. Again, in both cases, it's the same. Then in verse nine, by faith he lived. And it talks about how he went through this process, and whether it's Sarah or whether it's Abraham. And then by, in verse 10, for he was looking. He was looking for a city whose builder and so forth was God. He was looking for a better place. Uh, the Abraham story is the story of all of us because we all sense that we're born in a world that doesn't match us. That things are going wrong that should not. We say that should never happen. Well, it should never happen. And it was not supposed to happen. And Abraham was looking for that better place. And God is going to use Abraham. He's promised him. that He's going to use Abraham and his descendants to help people understand and find that better place. And then it says, by faith, if it's Abraham, it is, should be translated, he received the ability to procreate. Okay, if, it's, if that verse means Sarah, it says by faith, Sarah, that's the one that more translations, more Bible translations translate this as Sarah, by faith, Sarah. Then, uh, we, but we're just going for, forward here, verse 17, going forward, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, they both say that same thing. And finally, verse 19, he reasoned, this is the part where he says, you know, if God gave me this child from people who were almost dead, we, I was, uh, you know, they were, he was 100 and she was 90, and they were both past childbearing. It was very uh, beyond expectations that they would be, uh, that either of them would have children. And so that's, that, that's explaining, that is, Paul in Hebrews is explaining to his re audience, his readers, uh, how Abraham was able to, uh, what, what sustained his faith, what helped, helped him to go through this whole process. Well, if we look at this, we see that everything's consistent in the left-hand column, but the one in the right-hand column is, there's one anomaly, there's one thing that sticks out, and that is by faith, Sarah. In other words, in the middle of the Abraham topic, suddenly Sarah becomes the subject. Now, this is possible. Maybe that's what uh, the author was trying to convey. But it seems to me, and look, look for yourself, it seems to me more likely that Abraham was meant to be the topic. That this is all about Abraham because each of these individuals is taken individually and they're described as their faith that matters, is their, their faith that is used as an example for us to follow, to understand, to, to inspire us, to have similar faith. And so it appears to me that the, the more likely uh, translation is that it's about Abraham. By faith, he received the ability to procreate. Again, there's no absolute way of saying from the words of the text, of verse 11 itself, that narrow place. But it seems to me based on the entire, and the entire chapter, we could go through and look at the other, all the other heroes who are mentioned. And when it's about one person, it's about one person. So this would be very odd to interrupt the Abraham story and throw in Sarah. Is it happening? Is that what it was intended? Uh, maybe it was. But it seems to me it's more likely that it was not and that it is about uh, Abraham's faith. That despite the fact that he was past childbearing, and they both were, 
Uh, this was a gift that Abraham received. Now, uh, you can call that uh, patriarchal, you can call it uh, male-centric, whatever you want to. It just seems to me that the, uh, the text, the larger context of Hebrews 11 is uh, strongly on the side of rendering this as a being about Abraham. But you'll have to decide for yourself and do a good deal of study about it. That's a, what I, if, if you study this, uh, I have uh, achieved my purpose. Now, three uh, heroes of the faith. The next one that's mentioned is Moses. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. This is a remarkable thing because we know that that uh, in Egypt, or at least it's commonly claimed that the uh, uh, the royal line passed through the women. So the fact that he was Pharaoh's daughter would indicate that he would be the next Pharaoh. And uh, certainly he was a, a very highly placed. He would have been, I mean, even if he'd not been Pharaoh, he would have been uh, one of the nobility. He would have had all the luxuries that ancient uh, life could uh, bestow. Now, um, it's interesting when we think about all the luxuries that ancient life could bestow, we may think well about the King Tut's tomb and all the gold and, and uh, amazing things that were buried with him. We may forget that, that uh, King Tut had several serious diseases before he died and he had a club foot and uh, that the, the, uh, you know, the, the ministrations, the uh, depredations of sin had already uh, caused havoc on the Egyptian line, especially because there was a tendency toward uh, inbreeding. And so it would have uh, weakened and, and intensified these difficulties. So, and, he, and King Tut died around 17, age of 17. So you can talk about whatever you want to, about the, uh, the, the, the great things that they had, but life in, in the ancient world was pretty short for everybody most of the time. And uh, here, but here Moses, rather than accepting the, the life of ease that could have been his, took on a life of great struggle and eventually slight disappointment. He didn't make it the promised land, but don't forget, he was resurrected. All right. And this is an interesting thing because in John Milton's poem, his epic poem, Better to Ray, he says, uh, Paradise Lost, he says that uh, he has Satan, the character, say, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. But Moses intercedes for the children of Israel and even at one point says, you know, if you can't save them, blot my name out and save them instead of me. And so we have Moses here essentially saying better to serve the God of heaven than to reign in Egypt or to reign in this world. So it's a fascinating, uh, I just found this a, a, a beautiful uh, contrast between what we know was certainly legitimately uh, uh, the representation of, of uh, Lucifer's attitude. Better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. The final um, of the three heroes of the faith that uh, brought forth. And the final one is Rahab. And we can go on and on. He goes to the, the author of the lesson and, and Hebrews goes on and on about Rahab in many ways. But I'm going to talk a little bit extra about Rahab myself. For the Lord your God, he is God of heaven above and on earth below. This is what she says. This is part of her testimony. In, in uh, all of uh, the uh, in the book of Joshua, very few words are spoken, but she gets most of them. She has this wonderful prophetic speech in which she, she you know, prophesies about what, what God is going to do. And she makes this declaration of, this is a declaration of faith. The Lord, your God. And of course, the Lord here is, uh, as often happens in the Old Testament, the Lord here is simply a way of not having to say the name of God. The actual word in the text is Yahweh. 
For Yahweh, your God, he is God in heaven and earth, uh, heaven above and on earth below. And she has a very deep understanding of this. This is an expression of faith. And what's interesting about this is, and this is from my book, uh, For Such a Time, in essence, Rahab is the spy. Remember when they, uh, 40 years before, they sent 12 spies, two from each tribe. And we know the, the names of those people. We know the names of their fathers. We know the names of their grandfathers. We know what tribes they were from. And as a result of that, when they, the 12 uh, spies came back, only two spies were faithful, just two. And that was Caleb and Joshua. And they're still alive because they were faithful spies. But it's interesting because in Joshua 2, which is where the story of Rahab uh, is found, there are only two names. And those who have studied with me and have heard some of these things understand that in Old Testament narrative, uh, when, a, when a character is named, they're important. Now, the king of uh, Jericho is mentioned, but not by name. The only two names are those of Joshua and Rahab, and they occur in the first two verses of the chapter. So they are the two that matter. And so it says, in essence, Rahab is the spy. Instead of sending 12 spies, he sends two spies, which are not named. And why does he send two spies instead of 12? Probably because uh, this is an indication in the narrative that the author is telling us that two were faithful last time. Two are enough to do the job this time. Two will be faithful. You will get faithful reports from these two as there was a faithful report from the two 40 years earlier. But when you look at the, the two are not named, and when they come back and they report to Joshua, they simply report the words of Rahab. Because the two faithful ones here in Joshua 2 are Joshua and Rahab. Rahab is the spy. Everything Joshua instructed the spies to do, Rahab makes possible. She conceals them. She tells them what the uh, morale is of the people there. She tells them how to escape, uh, which rate, route to take, and how to get back safely. And she simply asks that her family be saved. And they are. So, what you have here is a fascinating situation where she is the faithful spy. So, these three heroes of the faith, what do they do? What does it make their, why is their faith so great? Now, there are other people, obviously, in chapter 11. But these three are, are picked out by our uh, lesson author for good reason. And this, what is true of them is true of the others. They trust God. That's what saving faith is. And they demonstrate that by acting in accordance with that trust. Just like the three Hebrew worthies who were willing to go and who were thrown into the fiery furnace. They didn't, they didn't run away. Just like that, Rahab acts in accordance with her faith. She trusts, she believes there is one God and she's going to trust that God. Abraham believes. He says, God gave me a child when it was impossible. So even if I have to sacrifice this child, maybe he'll give me that same child back, even though it seems impossible. I'll act as though what God, I'll act in trust. I'll act as though what he says is true, that I believe it. And so that is the key point here. Moses does the same. They all act in accordance with, with the trust they claim to have. And that's what, again, I say this a lot, but the, in James, it says, show me your faith by your works. That's what he's talking about. He's not saying, here's a list of good things you can do to earn your salvation. He's saying, if you have faith, that has consequences for your behavior. So don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you believe by acting upon it. And that, of course, is the way it works. We're not... We don't do good things to be saved, but when we are saved, when we are in a loving relationship, a saving relationship, a trusting relationship with God, we will act differently. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled to say that uh, my uh, own behavior reveals that I don't trust God nearly as much as I ought to. 
that sometimes my behavior is such that it shows that I don't trust God. And this is, this is something that he and I are working on. Uh, but uh, we all, I think, go there. You know, Paul said, you know, uh, I affirm the law in my, my mind, but in my body I see other things happening. So I say I believe God, and I think I believe God, and I, I, but at the same time, I'm, I'm flesh, and, and uh, I'm, I have the weaknesses of the flesh, and so I don't perform as I ought to. Thank God he has performed for me. So this then becomes the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus. Therefore, he says, you see, I've put this, I've, I've, I've uh, indented this because let us also is where the, the main sentence begins. The sentence, uh, the, the subject of the sentence is let us, us, we are the, we are the subject. Therefore, since, so he's, he's simply setting up the, car, the, the proof, therefore is a conclusion, and he's setting up the, the uh, summary of the evidence. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, surrounding us. He's just gone through Hebrews 11. He's just gone through all of these fascinating people who acted in accordance with their trust in God, who demonstrated their faith by their behavior. And he's saying, we have all these examples now. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also Lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We could have spent an hour or two minimum on this particular text. It's a, really a marvelous text. And I will be doing, I have a, a dialogue that I've done with my uh, own congregation on laying aside every weight, he talked about every encumbrance here. Another translation says laying aside every weight. And I want to just to notice a couple of small things here. We can't spend, a, we're running out of time, don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I think it's important to notice it at least. And that is, it says every encumbrance and the sin, because the encumbrances and the sins are not the same thing. Every encumbrance is not necessarily a sin. It may be that we have, as counselors will tell us, we have baggage. We have things that, uh, you know, that uh, have, have happened to us, traumas that have happened in the past, and they are, they are getting our way because we haven't dealt with them. They aren't our sins, they are the result of other people's sins, but they hinder our service because we're unable to do. I could go on about my own counseling and how much I've benefited through that. We all have these things that, that get in our way. And that's what he's saying, we should lay aside every encumbrance. Now, now, obviously, Paul isn't talking about therapy because it didn't exist back then. But we can understand this is part of systematic theology. Remember, systematic theology is what does it mean for us today? And it can be informed by science and by all sorts of things, because we have learned so much. And so every encumbrance means, you know, uh, I need to exercise more. That would be, an, and my weight is an encumbrance. Uh, there are other encumbrances that we have, other weights that hold us back, emotional, physical, and otherwise. And he's saying, you know, we need to diligently lay those things aside, because if we're healthier, we can witness better. Again, this is not about these being righteous acts that earn us anything, but rather because we have such a great cloud of witnesses and we have such uh, opportunity for faith, we can see we don't have to go through. You know, Abraham didn't have all this stuff to rely on. He had to he heard the voice of God, but that was all he had pretty much. We have this great long history and we know about the sacrifice of Christ. And so as a result of that, we should be grateful and we will begin to work on those things which are in the way. They are not necessarily sins of our own. They may be sins of things that people have done to us and the results of those, but they're still weights which hold us back. And so we should try to do everything we can to get rid of these weights. 
and the sins. Then there are the sins. Those are the things that we are failings. Those are the things which we do. Things, the choices that we make. The uh, falling short and all that, which they, they so easily entangle us. Uh, so that's the point. Let's get, let us lay aside everything that gets in our way. And if that requires uh, exercise, I'm going to have to do that. If it requires therapy, it requires dietary change, it retire, requires education. Whatever it is that, that is encumbered, that's a weight that holds us back. That's what we need to deal with. And then it says this, the race that is set before us. We have to run the race that is set before us. My race is not your race. I may have a, I may have a steeplechase and you may have a sprint. Or it may be the other way around. Or one may have a marathon. It doesn't matter. What matters is what race is set before you. What is the race set before me? We must run the endurance with the race, with endurance the race that is set before us. We don't always have a choice in those matters. But we need to run with endurance that, that race that we have. We shouldn't be looking at others and saying, well, I wish I had their race, or I wish I had this, that, or I wish they had the other thing. Each of us has a race set before us. God has us, has created us for a particular purpose to perform a particular function in his plan. And we are, will be the most happy and the most joyful when we're fulfilling that. And so we need to search for that, but we need to concentrate not on, well, his race looks easy, I'd like to do that. Or her race is, is uh, easier than mine, or I wish I could do this great, I wanna, I wanna go up Mount Everest. Maybe you need to race somewhere else. Whatever race God has set before you, that's the one that you need to do, endure. And maybe the endurance is, you know, this seems um, pretty pedestrian. There's not much going on here. I don't get, I don't understand why I have to do this thing again and again and again and again. But that's the way it works, isn't it? Each of us has a different race. And each of us only knows the race that we have. So this is a marvelous thing. The race that is set before us, no other. And Philippians 1.6 is not a text he uses, but it's important to understand. Being confident of this, he's just the, the, the author, he's the one who started it out. But he's also the perfecter, he's the finisher of our faith. And he's not just the finisher of our faith in the sense that he's the finisher of our doctrine or our theology or our understanding. He is the one who completes your faith. He is the one who completes my faith. And that's why I have Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He will perfect your faith. He will bring your faith more maturity. He will help you finish your race and finish your faith, the author and finisher, the author and perfecter, not just of our faith, of the faith, but of my faith, of your faith. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, not just the faith. And I'll even reword that slightly. There's the, here are the three keys for tonight's lesson. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith as well as the faith. So this is the final key, all right? And here are the three keys. Our faith manifests itself in confidence and endurance because it's based on God's faithfulness. That's where we started. Abraham's faith was based on God's faithfulness. Moses' faith was based on God's faithfulness. Our faith is always based on God's faithfulness. Uh, the, uh, these heroes of the faith trusted in God and demonstrated that by acting in accordance with that trust. It is not simply to say, I believe. I assent to certain beliefs and, and so forth, but I'm developing a, a relationship with Christ. And in that relationship, I want to uphold my end. I want to be true to him. Uh, I will fail, but he will forgive me. But I want to continue striving, not to be saved, but to be worthy 
of the salvation he has given me, to be the kind of friend. There's an old song, I'll be a friend of Jesus. You know, in the, he stood before the, in the court of uh, Paul, Pontius Pilate, he stood without a friend. Jesus needs a friend too, and I want to be his friend. And that, that friendship is hard. And sometimes we fail our friends, and that's going to be true here too. But we want to act and continually, and that's with, with any relationship, when we fail, we want to confess it and say, I still want to be your friend. I still want to be yours. Uh, you know, without, without forgiveness, marriage is impossible. I'll say that much. And then finally, the last key that we looked at, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, as well as the faith. It isn't just this overbroad, overarching theme. It isn't just theology. It isn't just Bible texts, but it is, in fact, our faith, our living faith, our saving faith. He is the author of it. He is the one who made it possible. And he will be the one who began that good work in us. He will be the finisher of our faith, too, the perfecter, the developer. Well, I hope that this has been useful to you. I hope that these lessons are of value. There are many ways to support this ministry, as I mentioned. And you'll see, uh, of course, I uh, provide extra uh, study for those who are my Patreons. But uh, we're done for this evening. And you can reach me at uh, BibleJourneys at Yahoo.com. And you can also find out what other things are going on and support us financially if you choose at patreon.com slash Bible Journeys. Um, we look forward to you. Of course, you can pray for us. We really like that. Click uh, like and also share any of those things. Subscribe so that you won't miss any of these. Thank you for being with me. And I hope that in, in a few days that we can embark on another. Bible journey together. Until then.